Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Rhonda Arab. Welcome to week three of our course. We're now moving from 14th century England, that is the late medieval period, to early modern England, specifically the late 16th century and the first half of the 17th century. This period is also sometimes known as Renaissance England or Tudor Stuart England, after the last names of the reigning monarchs. The Tudors were the monarchs in England from Henry VII in the late 15th century through Elizabeth I, who died in 1603. Then James I, a Stuart, became king, and after him, his son and grandson. I'm going to start our section on the plague in early modern Tudor Stuart England with a short lecture offering some social history. For reasons that are not fully known, the plague hit England and the rest of Europe hard in the 17th century. There were the most devastating outbreaks of plague since the Black Death of the mid 14th century. These happened in the 17th century and uh, the very worst of uh, the London outbreaks were in the mid 16th century. So um, the worst outbreaks at first was 1563 and then in 1603, 1625, and 1665. The mortality rates were staggering. The mortality rate was something like 60 to 80% of those afflicted. So out of everybody who got sick, sick 60 to 80% of them died. In 1603, that meant 25,045 plague burials recorded out of a population of 141,000 people. That was roughly 18% of the population um, that died of plague. In 1625, 26,350 burials were recorded out of a population of 2,600,000. So that was about 13% of the population. In 1665, over 50,000 people were buried who died of the plague. I mean, we should look at how those percentages would play out in British Columbia to get a sense of the magnitude of this. 18% of Greater Vancouver's population of 2.5 million is 450,000 uh, 450, people. As of today, January 16th, 2021, British Columbia had 59,000 cases of COVID and 1,031 deaths. If there were a 60% mortality rate to COVID, that would be 35,400 deaths in BC alone. Canada has so far had 17,507 deaths. Just to be clear, I'm not making these comparisons to suggest that Canada is over responding to the threat of COVID-19. I'm personally entirely on board with the restrictions we've been put under. I'm simply showing you the numbers so that you know that things have been much, much worse. We have to understand the plague in 17th century England as not simply a cataclysmic event. It wasn't a single event. It was also a constant presence. It ebbed and flowed through the years with breakouts coming and going, but it never fully disappeared. So the threat was always there and it was essentially a context within which people to some degrees always lived. The threat and the fear were always there. That threat was a defining characteristic of life in early modern Europe. And if we look at those dates that I laid out of the worst plague outbreaks in the late 16th and through the 17th century, we recognize that it's possible that individuals lived through two or even three outbreaks of plague. I mean, they would have been very lucky and or very privileged to manage to not die in one of them and to actually live through that many of them. But it was possible. 
And it's interesting uh, that literary histories of 17th century England rarely take into account that nearly every author from Shakespeare to Milton lived through at least one major outbreak of plague. Undoubtedly, these famous authors of ours would have known people who died. I mean, uh, a, a man who was not famous named Richard Smith made a list of his acquaintances who died in the 1664 and 1665 plague. 45 died in 1664, 45 people he knew personally, and 155 died in 1665. And some of our famous authors had close family members who did die. It's quite possible that uh, Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, who died at 11, died of plague. Ben Johnson's son, Benjamin Jr., died of plague at age seven. And we'll be looking at a poem he wrote about his son's death. In fact, there are signs of plague everywhere in the literature once you start noticing them, once you start paying attention. In Romeo and Juliet, which most of you have probably read or at least seen the movie, tragedy happens because of a quarantine order. And this is something I never really paid attention to before. Um, Friar Lawrence sends a messenger to Romeo to tell Romeo that Juliet is alive. But the messenger, Friar John, is put under quarantine because of an outbreak of plague. And so he is unable to get that message to Romeo. Romeo then finds Juliet in the tomb and she appears to be dead, although she is in fact only drugged. She's not dead, but Romeo thinks she's dead and he hasn't gotten the message that she is not dead. So he kills himself believing that she is dead. And then she wakes up to find Romeo dead, and then she kills herself. Also, remember, just before Mercutio dies, uh, after he's intervened between Romeo Montague and Tybalt Capulet in a fight, he cries out, knowing he's about to die, and angry. He says, a plague on both your houses. You know, we I've always heard that word plague in this context is simply a metaphor. It isn't necessarily a metaphor. Okay, what is plague? Well, it, it, I mean, we've learned some of this already from Dr. Coley in the section on the Black Plague, and the plague in early modern England was came from the same bacteria as the Black Plague, the uh, Yersinia pestis and it passed from uh, the fleas on rats to humans. And humans could get it from flea bites or they could get it from handling infected animals. The bacteria, uh, it, they, it could lay dormant during the winter among the rat population, but uh, when the warm weather came, warm weather favored the development of rat fleas. A plague generally needs a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius for several weeks in order for transmission processes to take place. So outbreaks were worse during the summer months. That bacteria, the Yersinia pestis, uh, it caused both septicemic, pneumonic, and bubonic plague in humans. It had a three to four day incubation period and then it overwhelmed the victim quickly and death would usually occur within a few days or a week. Now, of course, we can treat that with uh, antibiotics. There are three different types of illness caused by that bacteria. There is the uh, septicemic um, plague, which is an infection of the blood, um, and it spreads from bites of infected fleas, and, and that is the type that kills most quickly. The pneumonic plague is an infection of the lungs. It is spread person to person through breath, through aerosols but it can also start in the blood from flea bites and move to the lungs. So it can, you can get it that way. Uh, 
Bubonic plague, it enters through the skin the bacteria and travels to the lymph nodes of the groin, throat, and armpits. And it causes these excruciatingly painful swellings called buboes. And it is caused from flea bites or contact with bodily fluids of infected dead animals. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about early modern England understandings of the plague. Um, the belief was that plague originated in a miasma of putrefied air. Air um, that this putrefied air, this miasma, they, they believed it might be caused by a particular conjunction of the stars and or from the smells emanating out of filth, squalor, and decay. It was understood to be spread by close personal contact with the infected. And it was understood, so it was understood to be contagious. They, they did know that. And uh, in fact, um, merchants sometimes kept a bowl of vinegar on the counter for purifying coins that passed between them and customers. So they used vinegar the way we use uh, hand sanitizer. Now, there was no real understanding of rats and fleas as carriers, but there was some understanding that animals might carry um, the, the disease in their fur. So they weren't so off in some ways. And as a result of this, dogs and cats were killed um, which is sad, there were some massacres of dogs and cats as a way to try to avoid to the spread of plague. There is also, though, a record of a man in 1665 who told his servant to kill rats as well as cats. So, um, you know, there, this, there was a common view that rats and mice were portents of plague, signs that it was coming. So I, I guess perhaps that was a, a pointing in the right direction of understanding that they might also cause plague. Close observations led to the understanding that plague might be transmitted through clothes. And some of the measures taken uh, because of that observation actually were helpful to get rid of rats and fleas in that bedding and clothing of patients who had been afflicted would be burned. Likewise, although the miasma theory was not accurate, it did lead to um, increased cleaning of the streets because of the belief that the air um, from filth and squalor was causing the infection, that the uh, and it also led to burning fumigants in the street. Um, and since some of those fumigants contained sulfur or arsenic, they actually would have helped to get rid of uh, plague fleas. So some of the ways they approached the plague actually were effective, even though they didn't have the um, correct understanding of why they would be effective. Plague was very much an urban phenomenon. The outbreaks in England were, for the most part, in cities, the, the big outbreaks. It's not that it could not be found anywhere else. And of course, dense populations allow infection to spread easily. Um, and uh, because of that, people would flee the cities for the countryside to get away from the plague, if they could. Outbreaks usually started in London and traveled from there to other urban centers. Although there was also a major outbreak in Newcastle in 1636 that did not actually start in London and travel upwards. Uh, that outbreak in Newcastle came from the Netherlands. And in fact, it didn't spread, at least not in a major way, to, to London. So it didn't, it didn't always start in London and move from there, but most of the outbreaks did. Newcastle upon Tyne, like London, was a major port and a trade center. Um, and 
that Newcastle had an active trade with London, but also with countries outside of London, out of, outside of England. Um, as I said, London and Newcastle were both trade centers, and of course, London was also a center to which people traveled for pleasure. So we can see that, like today, trade and travel spread disease. Okay, who did the plague target? Well, the plague was only indiscriminate in its reach in the most superficial ways. I mean, it was largely an urban phenomenon, so it largely affected people in the city. And the parts of the city that were crowded and inhabited by the laboring poor were the hardest hit. There was definitely a correlation between poverty and plague. And that, in fact, was well known at, by at least 1603. The government bills of mortality tracking illness and death made it statistically very clear that there were much higher mortality rates in the poorer neighborhoods. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of evidence um, from the Newcastle 1636 plague, and in the surviving lists of burial figures, uh, we're really able to see where the worst outbreaks were. It, there were um, something like 10,000 deaths in a population of 313,000. So we can see where the worst outbreaks were, and they were in the parish of All Hallows, and within that parish, the worst outbreak was in Sandgate Ward. And Sandgate Ward was the most populated ward in the most populated parish in Newcastle. Nearly 25% of the Newcastle population was uh, lived in that parish. It was the poorest ward and it was where the families of keelmen, mariners, laboring men, craftsmen, and tradesmen lived. They lived packed in narrow streets and alleyways. There was also a large public dung hill there. So basically, the perfect conditions for plague existed in that ward. Large numbers of people in close, close proximity to each other and in close proximity to dirt and rats. The plague and plague deaths tended to cluster in individual households. And we see this, we see the evidence of this in the wills that people wrote shortly before dying of plague. And then we see further evidence of it in the official inventories of their estates that took place after they died. So for instance, a weaver uh, named Robert Walker. He wrote his will on August 27th, 1636, and he mentions, um, he, he mentions the burial of three children on August 9th, 10th, and 24th. And he also mentions the burial of his wife on August 22nd. So, he had been through the death of three children and his wife, and since he was writing the will, we have a good sense that he probably knew he would die soon as well. <clears throat> um, in another will, a man named William Graham, a skipper, he dictated his, his last will on May 31st, and he mentions that he needs to provide for his pregnant wife and two children. So that's what he was worried about providing for them after he died. But she clearly, you know, felt, believed that he was going to die soon. But then there's a, we've also got evidence of the inventory of his estate after his death. And that inventory records expenses for the funerals and the burial of not only himself, but also for three children. 
So it looks like the two children and the um, the unborn child of his pregnant wife all died shortly afterwards. Um, it looks like all of them died except the wife. And then we have evidence of John Collingwood, a shoemaker who made his will on October 6, 26 and was buried five days later. His estate inventory includes expenses for himself and six others in his household. So that was seven people in his household who died of plague. Um, so the disease clustered in households partly because it was contagious and um, partly because people lived in close proximity. Now, some of the policies that were adopted by urban magistrates, in fact, exacerbated that in that the um, magistrates would quarantine entire households for six weeks and the ill and the healthy would be quarantined together. Families, households might make efforts to isolate the sick within the household, and if they had an upstairs room, that would be somewhat possible, but people lived very crowded in very small spaces, especially poor people. So the chances of spreading to the rest of the household were very high when, when, the, when the ill and the healthy were quarantined together. Okay, before I go on to talk about government responses to the plague, I just want to mention, I read some really interesting stuff about how very ill quarantined people made wills. I mean, they couldn't leave their households. So I read this interesting account about a scrivener in Newcastle named Ralph Taylor. And he would go to quarantine houses and speak to people who were inside the house from the other side of the door, from the outside. And they would dictate their wills to him while he wrote down their testimony. And there's extensive documentary evidence that he, he made quite a lot of effort to, to get these last wills and testaments from people. And there's a story of him and witness with him climbing on top of the city wall and then sitting on the city wall uh, in order to copy down a will that was spoken to him by a man named Thomas Holmes, who um, spoke to him from the upstairs window of his of his home. And that's why they climbed up onto the city wall so that they would be level with uh, Holmes in his upstairs window. So Holmes was isolating up there from the rest of the family, so uh, you know, so he could not go downstairs and speak through the door because then the rest of the family would be there and he would put them in danger. Okay, government response. So what we have here is um, a pamphlet called. Orders sought meet by Her Majesty and her Privy Council to be executed in such places as are infected with the plague. So, uh, issued in 1578 um, and then printed in 1579, and they remained enforced until 1666 and, and reprinted uh, multiple times. Uh, so, these orders sought meet by Her Majesty. A dictated policy from one end of the kingdom to another. And this is what some of those policies were. So um, viewers and searchers were appointed to report plague deaths to parish clerks so that they could monitor the progress of the disease. So basically, these, these viewers and searchers would surveil their parishes to find out um, who was sick and who who was dead, and then they would report those numbers. And they would, you know, they had the um, authority to to check bodies for signs of plague. Um, and you know, they they looked for infected people who might be wandering the streets, and those people could be punished, and certainly they would be made to quarantine. <laughs> 
So that was one of the policies. Um, other other uh, orders thought meet by Her Majesty was to um, engage in taxation of the wealthier people in order to provide relief for the poor and the sick. So there were some attempts to help those afflicted. There are also it's also necessary to make provisions for the burial of the dead. There's a lot of people dying, and they need to be um, the corpses need to be taken care of. That was dealt with in these orders. They also uh, stipulated that streets were to be regularly cleaned, public assemblies were prohibited, and the quarantine orders were within um, this document. So as I said, public assemblies were, assemblies were prohibited, uh, visitors were prevented from entering the town, and fairs and markets were canceled or postponed. Uh, wandering beggars and vagrants um, were arrested and made to move on. To some extent, the poor were really under siege during plague times, since they lived in crowded and often unsanitary conditions that were associated with the plague. Some of those ramshackle housing settlements, which were often in the suburbs outside of the walls of the city, uh, they were subject to being ordered to be torn down. So that, that would happen sometimes. And they were, so they'd be torn down because they were seen as breeding grounds for disease. But of course, this could leave people unhoused with nowhere to go. On a less significant note, the theaters were closed during this time. Um, so uh, theater companies, including Shakespeare's, would in fact, because they could not perform in London anymore, they would tour the countryside during these London play closures. So that was a way for them to make up some of their lost revenues. It was also safer to be in the countryside than to be in London. So it made a lot of sense for them to do that. Now, in terms of burial, um, the burial of the dead, uh, clothing and bedding of plague victims were, were burnt so that they could not spread any more infection. And funerals were held at dusk to reduce numbers of participants. The corpses were wrapped in winding sheets and very often put in communal grave pits. And then they would be covered with quicklime in order to um, kill bacteria. Not only could only the prosperous afford coffins, there literally wasn't room in the graveyard for each body to be put in a coffin. Okay, so I've got some images here that are relevant to the burial of the dead. And on the left there is a 17th century engraving. It's from the mid 17th century. It's a woodcut. It's an engraving of um, communal plague graves. And you can see in it uh, wagons of dead bodies and the grave with multiple different multiple bodies being put in. It's a communal uh, communal grave. And then on the right, the Google map image, it marks all the places in and around London where historians believe plague pits existed. So they've done the our archaeological um, investigations and they believe that those are all where plague pits were once uh, dug. Okay, so quarantine orders. Um, infected houses and towns were to be shut up for at least six weeks, it's a long time, with all members of the household, as I said, sick and healthy inside. Uh, a foot high red cross was painted on the front door of houses that were quarantines with the words, God have mercy on us painted there as well. The quarantined residents of the household would be shut in with wooden poles nailed across the door. 
it's not clear how tightly they were locked in. Um, they, they, the doors might have just been barred to prevent exit uh, with the door opening inward so that provisions could be taken in, could be passed over the, um, the, the, the poles, keeping them from exiting. Um, also, there are reports of people exiting through a back door. So I don't know if that was just cases where they had failed to secure the back door or whether they never secured the back door. At any rate, I mean, it took a lot of personnel to enforce these orders. Watchmen were appointed to enforce the order and to guard the sealed doors. And then another officer, other officers would be appointed to provide the inmates with food. So you can really see that it would have been difficult and expensive to guard all homes when the numbers of ill were as high as they were. Uh, watchmen had legal authority to use violence to keep people shut in. Um, and anyone uh, with a plague sore found wandering outside in the company of others was guilty of a felony and might be hanged. Uh, anyone going out when they were supposed to be on quarantine could be whipped as a vagrant rogue. Now, there's actually no evidence that anyone was actually um, charged or punished as a felon. That is, the death penalty was essentially a deterrent more than a reality. But there is evidence of whippings, um, and there is also evidence of uh, escapees from quarantine being punished with the lesser punishment of being put in the stocks. In small villages uh, where houses were far apart from each other, uh, men were sometimes allowed out to uh, tend to cattle and crops. But while they were out, they had to wear distinguishing marks on their clothing or carry a white stick so that people would be well aware of their status as somebody who had plague. So on your left here is someone in the stocks. I just wanted, I'm sure you've seen pictures of people in stocks. And this picture is not, that person there is not actually in there for a plague infraction. It's somebody famous who was uh, put in the plague for libel. But I just thought I'd include it. And then on the right is just a very bad joke about public reactions to COVID infractions. The quarantine orders were controversial. Quarantining of a whole household was controversial because some rightly argued that it was a guarantee that the healthy would become ill and therefore increase mortality rates. And others simply argued that it was cruel. It was cruel. Uh, the authorities, though, the government didn't to take well to criticism of their quarantine orders and publish, punishment was threatened against anyone who criticized the orders as uncharitable. Okay. I mean, the authorities were insistent that the orders were designed to give succor and relief to victims of the plague. Not all authorities were completely on board with these orders, though. Some London authorities complained about the policy as well. These policies were national policies. And some London authorities complained because they noted that it would increase the numbers of the ill. And of course, they were right about that. In some smaller cities, um, they were able to isolate the sick outside of their homes in sick houses, uh, in you know sheds outside the city walls. And that did serve the purpose of limiting contagion, but it, it was also essentially sending the off to die. And not all cities even felt that they could afford this, especially if their numbers were high. London did not do this. Newcastle did. Newcastle was a smaller city. Interestingly, isolation measures were stricter in England than in uh, some other European countries. 
So for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, visits were not only allowed to people who were in quarantine, but were encouraged for the purposes of religious consolation and also for medical help. And inmates were um, also allowed to go outside and refresh themselves um, as long as they carried markers that distinguished themselves as being infected with the plague. Okay, I, I have always found the image of the plague doctor to be striking and dramatic. Um, but then, of course, you know, when you actually compare it to a doctor in modern um, PPE, it's not really so much different. Um, so what we have left is a, a 17th century engraving of a plague doctor um, made by a, a German artist. And basically in his 17th century um, PPE. Uh, and that snout on the mask, there's a reason for that. It's not just there to look super dramatic. Uh, inside of the snout in that long nose, there would be aromatic spices and herbs, which were meant to protect the wearer from the bad air. You know, because that contagion was believed to transmit through smells. And that uh, very covering cloak that he's wearing is either leather or oil cloth. So it's very protective and he's wearing gloves, you can see. He's also got crystal glasses on to protect his eyes. Uh, and he's carrying a wand, and I'm not entirely sure what that wand is for. Um, it could be for measuring distances of how far to stay away from the patient. So it's your little measuring stick for social distancing. It could be for prodding the patient during examination. I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, So those um, those plague doctors. I mean, let's. What did what did the plague doctor do? Well, medical writers treated the plague in the 17th century as a poison that needed to be cast out of the body. And bleeding or bloodletting was still considered the best way to do that and the best way to balance the humors, that is to balance what were considered the four vital bodily fluids. Uh, the efficacy of this was starting to be debated by the end of the 16th century, uh, but it was still a practice. Other things the plague doctor did is that they would attempt to break the buboes so that the pus would be dispelled. And, and if, they, if that was difficult to do, they could put dressings, herbal dressings on the buboes in order to try to um, get the pus to uh, dispel. They also had uh, medications. Um, mithridatium, which was called treckle, was, was used as a medication. And, and it was basically a concoction of opium, herbs, and other ingredients like ginger, cinnamon, and castor. And it also included, um, perhaps not in 17th century England, but originally it was supposed to include viper's flesh. It was all pulverized together and mixed with honey. No, no, I, I mean, the, the herbs might have done some good, and certainly the opium would have been helpful. Um, other herbs, such as rue, was used uh, against fever. Um, and, and these herbal concoctions probably had medicinal effects, even if they couldn't cure the plague. There were, however, all kinds of other remedies touted in various medical tracts that were published at the time that were really truly dubious, um, such as wearing a precious stone on the fourth finger of the left hand, applying a live hen to a bubo to draw out the poison, uh, drinking your own urine, um, or wearing an arsenic amulet or talisman next to your skin. So yeah.
the 17th century had its quack remedies for their epidemic illness. Okay, this is a plague broadsheet. Um, a broadsheet was a, a cheap publication. Usually a single large sheet would be sold cheaply by street vendors and it would give news, news items, information that was of interest contemporary for contemporary issues. And uh, play time broadsheets like this one were often headed with the uh, Lord have mercy upon us. And you can see that in, in the, um, the image there. And like this one, a lot of space was taken up by statistics on plague death. And that's what's running all kind of around the sides of this broadsheet. Um, you can't see it very well, but in that illustration, it, it is a, a picture of Londoners fleeing the city. And you can kind of see the little people with horses and the, and the city in the background, the walled city, and people are leaving it. And above the city, that is the angel of death that is hanging over the city. Um, other uh, broadsheets were actually more illustrated than this one um, with drawings along the borders of skeletons, death heads, corpses, and winding sheets, etc. And these broadsheets, uh, they also often included prayers um, and information about cheap medicines. Okay, so this is an image of the city. Um, um, I, I'd like just to see a bit about how the city looked during plague. And the streets would not have been completely empty, but they certainly would have been quiet. As you can see here, there, there are people on the street, um, but not a lot. It's, it, it, the streets would have been much quieter than the usual, you know, the noise with the usual clamor and the bustle of a trading port town, you know, that was an economic and a social center. Instead, you would, there would just be a few people out to get food and drink, uh, to find work if they could. The streets would become essentially just passageways for getting from one place to another. And there would no longer be that kind of street life that normally existed in, in this bustling city. You would no longer have people sitting in the doorways, um, as uh, many women used to do. They would sit in the doorways with their work so that they could chat with other women and with passerbys. And we can also think of the sound. It would be quieter, obviously, much quieter, but you would, the sound of bells announcing deaths would be heard regularly. Also, it would look somewhat differently, and, and the image is quite good for this. Um, doorways would be barred or locked shut, and you can see here the red crosses, a, an image of a red cross painted on the door with the Lord have mercy on this house. Uh, we don't see in this picture I don't think I see anywhere corpses but people people would find corpses on the street people would just die suddenly on the street and uh, you know in fact there's an archival report of two Londoners who died while they were in the stocks so you can imagine what a grim sight that was and perhaps they were in the stocks because they were infected and they weren't adhering to quarantine Oh, I think actually maybe this, oh yes, this, this image does right behind the fire. You can see a corpse being taken away on some kind of stretcher. Yeah, and, and the people in here, some of these people, they appear to be in mourning or in despair. They don't look particularly happy. You can also think about the smell. The air would smell differently from all the tar fires that were being burned to despair the miasma of infection and you can see of course the burning fire here and the air might also smell of death those corpses that might lie on the street for hours or even days before the authorities removed them would certainly be emanating a terrible smell <laughs> 
And then in the graveyard, those pits will be opened daily to empty more bodies into them. So it's pretty dismal. And I'm just going to end here with this uh, final image. This is a 17th century engraving um, that displays the often macabre humor that accompanied plague literature in the period. Uh, this is a kind of image that you might find on one of those plague broadsheets. Um, you know, you <laughs> the skeletons are dancing and, and playing music and generally having a fun time. And I, I guess it's really just suggesting the way in which death is reigning uh, during these very grim times. Okay, thank you. That That is today's lecture on social history. Our next lecture will be on some of the discourses, some of the ways in which people understood the plague, particularly the religious discourses. Thank you.